Today, China is ruled by the Chinese Communist Party and has been for a very long time. The 1949 Chinese Communist Revolution brought the group to power under the ruthless eye of Mao Zedong, and they've not even come close to surrendering power since. While the party is moderated in some ways, including opening its economy, the party is infamous for cracking down on dissent and suppressing any threat to its power. So, how did the CCP get this strong, and how did we get here? The Chinese Communist Party might have ruled for a long time, but they're newcomers compared to who was ruling China until 1911, the Qing Dynasty. The latest and last imperial dynasty, this Manchu-led group began its reign in 1636 and began as a regional dynasty in Manchuria. Eight years later, it had seized Beijing and soon ruled all of China and expanded the country's territory. The dynasty was known for modernizing China and building one of the largest empires in the world. But as the 20th century dawned, trouble was brewing. Western countries were in increasingly interested in China, and Japanese expansionism was posing trouble, and the Qing dynasty was seen as unready to tackle these major threats. And that meant revolution was brewing. The Qing dynasty had suffered a series of military defeats against the West, and so the successive emperors started to invest in military infrastructure. But with the Qing dynasty still ruling as an absolute monarchy, the government was relatively immune to popular swings. The wars typically ended with China signing unequal treaties with the West, lowering the standard of living. Additionally, a series of civil wars and rebellions in parts of China led to massive casualties and famines. The government hoped this newly modernized army would be able to resist invaders, and then learned a very harsh lesson lesson in the First Sino-Japanese War when Japan thoroughly defeated China. The emperor was ready for a change, but not everyone agreed. The Gongzhu Emperor, the current ruler, was a young man and his reign had been dominated by regents for most of his life, but he was an adult now and took the advice of reform advocates to institute sweeping changes to the government, economy, and education systems. This massive plan only lasted 100 days until a coup led by the former regent Empress Dowager Cixi. She had no problem deposing her nephew and placing him under house arrest, whereupon she ruled as an absolute dictator until her death in 1908, no doubt pleased that she had secured the future of the dynasty from reform forces. But she could not have been more wrong. Sixi had a staunchly anti-foreigner policy aiming to repel invasions by targeting foreign traders and Chinese Christians. The result was another foreign invasion in 1900, and another harsh settlement that saw many people have their livelihoods devastated. In the aftermath, groups dedicated to keeping the empress in power were formed, but other counter-revolutionary groups stymied them. The result was conflict but little actual change, followed by another brutal famine in 1906 and 1907. The Empress Dowager Cixi and the Guangzhou Emperor died within one day of each other, with historians proving the young emperor was poisoned, and that led to a chaotic power vacuum. And as groups jockeyed for power, an unbeknownst name emerged in the countryside. Mao Zedong was born in December 1893, the son of a peasant farmer who had built a massive landowning empire in rural Hunan. The businessman was a harsh taskmaster who abused his son and siblings. While his religious mother provided what little comfort young Mao Zedong experienced, his father's wealth allowed him to get a good education, although he found little interest in the classic Confucian texts. Instead, he preferred to lose himself in novels. He was forced into an arranged marriage as a teenager, but rejected her and left the family, then helped him to radicalize as he became an activist against arranged marriage and other traditional Chinese practices. Before long, he was developing a taste for revolution, reading the works of classic Western reformers and attending an elite secondary school where he was bullied for coming from a farming family. And this class warfare would become a key part of his worldview, but that was a long time off. In the halls of power in China, powerful pro-reform groups were gaining power. Some were former loyalists who believed change was necessary, while others were young radicals who believed that the entire dynastic system must be overthrown, by any means necessary. With no clear successor, Empress Dowager Cixi was replaced by Emperor Dowager Longyu, who was seen as a weak replacement. The actual Emperor Pu Yi was only two years old and wasn't even a figurehead yet, likely more concerned with his rattle than the state of the empire. While the various revolutionary forces clashed with each other, they had one thing in common, strong anti-Qing sentiment and the growing belief that anything would be better than the current state of affairs. But it wouldn't be that easy to turn that into a cohesive revolution. Uniting a group that included royal intellectuals, military leaders, anarchists, nativists, and foreign investors hoping for a more business-friendly climate would not be easy. Complicating things, not all investors in the coming revolution were benevolent. Japanese power brokers wanted to see a revolution happen because they thought it would make it easier for Japan to seize Manchuria. The Black Dragon Society, a far-right Japanese group, was seen as a key player in the revolutionary forces, and in the years before the change in power, many uprisings were common. Very few were successful 
rule, but all served to weaken the dynasty's grip on power and the feeling of invincibility. Until the dam broke. On October 1911, a revolt began in Wuchang. But something was different about this one. It was led by members of the New Army, the dynasty's elite fighting force. This led to a series of revolts around the country, and they were all well organized enough that they were able to gain control of the country. The Qing court renounced its absolute power, appointed a prime minister, and sought to broker a peace deal. The new prime minister, Yuan Shikai, was a practical man and hoped to restore order. But it soon became clear that this would be impossible, as revolutionary forces formed a provisional coalition government in Nanjing. Conflict broke out between the North and South over the choice of leadership. Ultimately, it was decided that Xi Kai would lead China into the future as the President of the Republic of China. But this wouldn't last as long as many hoped. As the empire crumbled and the final young emperor abdicated, China had a new government. But its leader wouldn't be around to see it develop. Yuan Shikai died in 1916, and the fledgling government descended into chaos with warlords seeking power around the country. There was even a brief attempt to put the child emperor back on the throne, making for a very confusing childhood, no doubt. But despite this, the rebellion known as the Xinhai Revolution was successful in ushering in China's first non-royal government in several hundred years. But storm clouds were on the horizon. The warlord era of China lasted over 10 years, with many provinces declaring independence while Yuan's successor failed to reunite the country. However, Chiang Kai-shek would prove to be a different story altogether. A seasoned military leader and believer in a unified China, he sought to shrug off foreign influence and turn China into a world power in its own right, getting rid of his Soviet advisors. Seeing the Soviets' hands in a growing communist movement in China, he killed thousands of activists and set up a new government based in Nanjing. After overthrowing a rival government and unifying the country, Chiang Kai-shek began a decade of vast progress, but also of significant oppression as he crushed the opposition to his rule. But he didn't get all the opposition. Mao Zedong had many opportunities, but he was uninterested in many of them. Instead, he followed his passions, and they led him to the top of the rebel army, where he served briefly as a private soldier. He left after six months, discovered socialism after reading pamphlets, and briefly dabbled in police work, law school, and government work. All the while, he kept up with his interest in global literature and philosophy, and soon developed quite the ego. He viewed himself as an elite who knew better than the common folk. His defining principle was that the great men of history were not bound by moral codes, but by striving for a great goal. His interest in philosophy angered his father, who disowned him. Mao eventually chose to enroll in a teaching school where he was increasingly radicalized by his professors and fellow students, and he was watching the events in government closely. As China descended into its warlord years, Mao found himself becoming more and more radical. He developed an interest in socialism during his time at school, before moving to Beijing where he studied under a devout Marxist named Li Dajiao. This intellectual had been following the Russian Revolution and was one of the first activists to bring those ideas to China. During this era, Mao was heavily involved in protests and became well known as a writer of revolutionary articles. At this point, he was still a little-known figure and would help to found the Chinese Communist Party in 1921. While he wasn't one of the original founders, he would be responsible for launching the Self-Study University, which made access to Marxist literature much easier. The Marxists started small, organizing workers for strikes and protests around the country, and by 1927 the country would descend into war. Chiang Kai-shek's turn against the communists led to brutal killings, but the communists were far from just a ragtag group of activists at this point. They were in control of several cities, including Shanghai, and when local governments turned against them and began expelling them, Mao and his units began forming their own peasant militias to defend the cities. But much like many revolutionaries before him, Mao found himself outmanned, outgunned, and overpowered. His attempts to take the city of Changsha failed, and he and his unit retreated into the mountains. He was seen as a radical even by the Chinese Communist Party, which expelled him from their ranks, and he was left to form a base of his loyalists for those who opposed the CCP's increasing attempts to cooperate with the government. His breakaway group trained, forming one of the communist movement's best fighting forces, but ignored orders from the Central Committee, and soon he would be at war with the most powerful communists in the world. The Soviet Union had heavy influence on the Chinese Communist Party, and in 1929 replaced the current leader with two Soviet loyal members. Mao was opposed to the new leadership and broke away further, forming his own government in southwest Jiangxi. Some of his members accused him of being too moderate and attempted to overthrow him, to which Mao and his loyalists responded with a brutal purge. As Chiang Kai-shek continued his targeting of Mao's armies and the calendar ticked into the 1930s, the Red Army led by Mao and his ally Zhao Enlai continued to advance. But a much bigger threat was looming. 
Chiang Kai-shek viewed the communists as China's biggest threat, but he couldn't have been more wrong. China had been dealing with an increasingly aggressive series of incursions by Imperial Japan, and by 1931 they occupied Manchuria. Even after this takeover, Chiang Kai-shek refused to declare war on Japan, viewing it as a distraction from the more pressing threat of communism, and this outraged the general so much they staged a coup, arresting Chiang Kai-shek and forcing him to sign a ceasefire with the communists that would dissolve the Red Army and form a unified Chinese Chinese military to combat Japan. Not surprisingly, given the start, the results would be mixed. China fought back against Japan, but they were heavily outgunned. Additionally, conflict between the two armies continued, with Chiang Kai-shek ordering his nationalist forces to attack one of the communist armies for insubordination. In some ways, this might have been good for the war effort, because it essentially ended any collaboration between the two forces and thus reduced the risk of conflict. Both the communists and the nationalists had the same enemy at the moment, but they all knew that this was only a ceasefire and Mao would take full advantage of the situation. The Second Sino-Japanese War was a horror show for China, with Japan committing some of the worst war crimes in human history against the civilian population of places like Nanjing, while Chiang Kai-shek's army was seen as a bulwark against the invaders. They were also seen as ineffectual in stopping the advance of the Japanese. The suffering of the people opened many minds to Mao's teachings, and as the Red Army spread through the countryside to fight the Japanese, they left their teachings in their wake. Mao was a savvy campaigner and worked to organize the people and make land reforms along the way. The war would last a horrifying eight years and end with the defeat of Imperial Japan at the hands of the Allies. And in the aftermath, the conflict in China would renew itself once more. China was liberated with the defeat of Japan, but the war would leave lasting scars. China suffered massive casualties in the war, with at least 20 million Chinese citizens dying fighting in the Japanese massacres and families. As the war ended, China's economy had been devastated, turning its economy into a slim fraction of what it was before the war. But don't worry, the US is here to help. The Allies flooded the market with cheap American goods, which served as a band-aid on the gaping wound. This resulted in an economy where the value of the currency dropped fast, the poor got poorer, and the rich got richer. And as Russia had learned decades earlier, this was a recipe for only one thing. Mao Zedong had been biding his time since the war with Japan broke out. He knew time was on his side, and Chiang Kai-shek would face the wrath of the public for his failings in the Lido. Mao's support was growing in the countryside, and he even began winning the loyalty of armies previously aligned with the government. Soon, Mao commanded armies of more than one million Chinese people, a powerful force against a government only starting to recover from a brutal war, and many of the areas previously occupied by Japan had been liberated by the communists. And when the communists liberate something, they don't usually leave. The communists considered areas freed of the Japanese army to be their liberated zone and essentially controlled the area's governments. They had a key advantage, concentrating their efforts on rural areas where the Allies weren't as concerned with fighting the Japanese during the height of World War II. They allowed Mao to recruit loyalists and consolidate territory with little opposition, giving him a powerful base of support if the Cold Civil War was going to turn hot again, and Mao's support base was about to get shaken up. While Mao was gaining support in China, the situation for him in the global scene was less favorable. Mao's relations with the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin were chilly, and the Allies had ceded parts of China to the Soviets in the final peace deal at Yalta. And all the Allies, the Soviets included, recognized Chiang Kai-shek's government as the legitimate government of China. Now that the war was over, the United States and its allies were turning toward viewing the communists as the main threat to their coalition. That left Mao the distinct underdog in the battle for China. But Mao was about to get an unintended assist. As Japan surrendered and the Soviets invaded Manchuria, Chiang's obsession with defeating the communists led him to make a risky decision, asking the Americans for assistance to prevent the communists from consolidating power in areas they liberated. He even ordered surrendering Japanese troops to not surrender their arms to communist forces. This made many Chinese citizens feel like they were under military occupation once again, and the American forces were caught in scandals that only exacerbated those negative feelings and created a powder keg of resentment. One that Mao was all too ready to exploit. Soon, open conflict between the nationalists and the communists would begin once again, this time centered in previously occupied Manchuria. The United States tried to force both sides into a coalition government, but resentments were rooted too deep and both sides mostly used the period of American occupation to arm themselves and plan for war. By 1946, the communists were well armed and deeply entrenched in Manchuria. When the nationalists made their move, they were initially able to push the mostly civilian army back until the Soviets made the dramatic decision to give captured Japanese weapons to the communists. Suddenly, Mao's army was transformed from a scrappy army of millet plus rifles to a fighting force. 
This would be the beginning of the end for Chiang Kai-shek's government. The battle of the communists versus the nationalists was now a full-fledged war, with the US backing the nationalists and the Soviets the communists, but both superpowers were cautious to not get directly involved. As the foreign troops withdrew, the skirmishes turned into all-out conflict, and Mao's forces found themselves facing a massive nationalist surge. The Chinese Communist Party had radicalized, with those wanting to take over all of China winning out. But they knew they couldn't take the nationalists into a conventional war. Instead, they developed a passive defense strategy where they abandoned territory as needed to prevent heavy losses and continued to recruit in the countryside. When they saw an opportunity, they counterattacked, and soon China would be divided. Now calling itself the People's Liberation Army, the Communists made a big move in 1948, capturing the major northern cities of Shenyang and Changchun. A brutal siege of the latter city between the two armies led to six figures in deaths, mostly from starvation. But this had a side effect. The nationalist armies had a reputation for harsh treatment of its recruits and bare rations, while the communists at this point offered more egalitarian treatment of low-ranking soldiers. And as the war raged on, more and more of Chiang Kai-shek's soldiers began defecting to the communists. This would turn out to be the decisive factor in the war. As the defectors came, so did their arms. First it was guns, then it was tanks and heavy artillery, and soon the communist army looked a lot like their opponents. While the People's Liberation Army ground for every inch of land they had, they replenished their own forces with defectors and recruits from the countryside. But the war only seemed to be going in one direction, with the communists gaining strength and Chiang Kai-shek's forces looking more spent with each passing day. It was starting to look like Mao would win the day, and that made even Stalin nervous. With the Soviet dictator attempting to broker a coalition government, it failed, and soon the nationalist forces were reduced to a mere corner of the country. A new government was ready to take control. It was October 1, 1949, when Mao Zedong stood in Tiananmen Square in Beijing and proclaimed the founding of the People's Republic of China. Beijing was to be the new capital, and the country's founding was accompanied by a massive military parade. It was the largest communist victory since the October Revolution in Russia brought Lenin to power, and the entire world viewed China's change in power with nervousness. However, the conflict may have been won, but it was far from over. Because Chiang Kai-shek still stood, and he intended to keep it that way. The nationalist leader, far from a Democrat but still favored by the West, fled to the island of Taiwan with over half a million nationalist troops and more than two million refugees. For all practical purposes, Taiwan was now separate from China, but the People's Republic claimed it was still a Chinese province that needed to be liberated. Not to be outdone, Chiang Kai-shek established his own government in Taipei and declared himself to be the leader of the Chinese government in exile and the rightful authority over all of China. The war was over, but the conflict was still raging. Skirmishes between the communists and the nationalists continued on the mainland. Although the communists were mostly just putting down the last remnants of opposition, they soon turned their eyes to expanding their territory, with the Kingdom of Tibet falling with relative ease. China still occupies Tibet today, with little global opposition remaining, but other attempts to expand would be trickier. Taiwan was too well defended to fall easily, with Chiang Kai-shek turning the small island into a veritable fortress and ruling it until his death in 1975. While he was known by many as the man who lost China, the ruthless military leader was seen by others as a hardline anti-communist, which helped him maintain support in the Western world during the Cold War. But a new war was about to break out. In 1950, a civil war exploded in the Korean Peninsula, bordering China and it would parallel the one in China proper in many ways. On one side, a revolutionary communist force led by Kim Il-sung, backed by the Chinese Communist Party. On the other side, a military dictatorship in the South standing up to the forces of communism and backed by the United States. While the political climate was similar, the stakes were different. And after seeing what had happened in China, the US was not taking any chances. It soon became a larger war with direct US involvement. In the end, an armistice was brokered between North and South Korea, with the divide remaining to this day. But perhaps more significantly, the United States stationed its 7th fleet in the Taiwan Strait, essentially forestalling any open war between the two Chinas again, a frozen conflict that continues to this day. And the Chinese Communist Party's power was about to be locked down in a major way. The development of nuclear power changed the face of the world, with one country after another claiming their own piece of the nuclear pie. The United States was followed by the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, France, and then in 1964, China, after an extensive project that heavily benefited from Soviet help. While relations between China and the Soviets broke down extensively in the decades after the revolution, they were both staunch opponents of the United States, and China was a valuable part of the Soviet Union's plan to check the power of their arch rival. And in China, Mao was taking measures to ensure he would never face a challenge to his leadership again. 
Now that Mao's war for control of China was over, he turned his attention to domestic affairs, targeting his political opposition in a series of harsh measures known as the Cultural Revolution. This targeting of dissidents and restructuring of China's entire social and economic system resulted in millions of deaths, many from famine, and hollowed out any opposition to the Chinese Communist Party. Mao was able to rule largely unchallenged until his death in 1976. While his successors were seen as more moderate by comparison, by the time he was finished there was little in the way of opposition in China, at least any opposition that was alive. And that would be Mao's legacy, considered by many to be the worst mass murder in human history, but no one can deny his success in keeping the CCP in control of China. The Chinese Communist Party has outlasted the Soviet Union by several decades, although it's only ostensibly communist now. Not bad for a revolution that started in the wake of the collapse of a four-century empire and might not have happened if some schoolboys had more respect for their peasant-born classmate. Want to know more about Mao's reign of terror? Check out Meet the Man Responsible for the Most Deaths in History, or watch this video instead.